I asked two people to read two scriptures, uh, and I don't know where you are. So if if I ask you to read a scripture, uh, come on, you no use the mic because it's hard to hear it way in the back, and we'll do that okay. that way. I'll, I'll take care of it. Can can yeah. this is this on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. these are just scriptures about potters and how God is always the potter in scripture. <laughs> This is Isaiah 29, 16. The Lord is speaking. He says, You turn things upside down, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, He did not make me? Can the pot say of the potter, He knows nothing? That's good. He's got... I'm sorry, I only gave you... It's 45 now. And 45, nine. <coughs> Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say, he has no hands? Good. <laughs> and I'm reading from Jeremiah 18, 6. O Israel, can't I... Can't I do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand. Good. Thank you. So as you can see there, we're always this lump of shapeless clay uh, as, as people. And God is always the potter. Yeah, and it's just it, that theme... Uh, you can see through scripture again and again and again of God doing something with this shapeless piece of um, clay. And it's also in the, in the New Testament. Those were two Old Testament scriptures, but Paul also quotes that in the New Testament. Um, and in a minute, we're going to do this really cool thing. And this is the talk when nobody listens to me and they just watch her. But uh, for a second, I just want to do one PowerPoint slide here. And then we're going to have Mary up on the slide so you can see. Um, a lot of people say, uh, how do you, you haven't really, you know, I'll do the uh, characteristics of the hamster wheel, which we did this morning, and then today we're going to talk about the characteristics of the potter's wheel, but people say, well, what's that transition process? And so I just wanted to make a slide to make uh, that real clear. We've touched on this already, but to make it real clear, step one from the hamster wheel to potter's wheel is honesty. That's the big key. Can I admit my doubt? Can I admit my sadness, my inability to get the outcome I want? Can I just be myself with God? Can I lay it out uh, there? Do I trust God enough to be real? Because the more authentic you are with God, the more you're able to um, state the truth about where you are, uh, that shows God that you trust him with more, right? So you don't have to cover it up. And that's a growth process too. But honesty is the first step. Then step two, um, and that's why I love working in recovery so much, because there's so much honesty there. And I shared that with you this morning. Uh, and then there's the resolve to want to grow. Can I stop or withdraw from enabling a frenetic or dysfunctional lifestyle for myself or for others? Can I stop being a people pleaser and set some realistic boundaries? Um, and, you know, for some, as we talked about, the hamster wheel is just too familiar uh, to leave. Better the hell you know than the abyss you don't know. Uh, like a bird in a cage that gets used to the cage. And I, my bird, you know, in a dirty cage, I, I, I closed the door to the study, let it fly around for a while, you know, and I was trying to clean the cage. And then the phone rang, went to the phone, came back, the bird was back in the dirty cage. Just the freedom was too scary uh, for the bird. So can I stop? Do I really want this? And can I deal with freedom? Because sometimes it's too scary. Can I surrender to God? Not to everyone else's expectations of me. Can I have a vertical gaze and see God first? And that's part of the potter's wheel we'll be talking about um, in a minute. And then step three, we talked about this, and we did the surrender prayer a little bit in worship. That's what I call the surrender prayer when you uh, put your palms upwards. Uh, surrender to God's purpose. Uh, it's not by power or by might, but by my spirit. I've got to yield if I'm the clay. Um, that's what we say, have thine own way, Lord. You are the potter. I am the clay. And you felt that Play-Doh. These are awesome, by the way. There's so much variety here. As I told you, there's more variety here than any other church I've ever done this with. 
Um, and some of you have been sharing with me the meaning of these things and, uh, you know, talk to each other about it because the stories behind these uh, dreams and the way that you see that God's forming you, pretty moving stories. God is doing some amazing things uh, with you. So um, that yielding, that flexibility, um, it's not easy. It sometimes is the hardest right at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to, so, so those are the three steps to moving you know, and this, this sometimes is a gradual process, but moving from hamster wheel to potter's wheel. All right. Um, now, I, you can put her up on the screen, and you can start. There she is. Is that cool? Um, and we're going to have a little dialogue here. I'm going to talk to Mary. All right. You got that mic so people can hear? Okay. All right. Um, now, Mary, I heard that often potters throw down the clay really hard at first. Yeah. I mean, you just throw that thing. Well, you've got to, uh, the way I look at it is when you're a Christian, God says, do you really mean it? You know, and he wants, like she said, she, he wants an authentic commitment. He wants us to be totally real. And that means we've got to stick. And that means that we've got to be firmly planted on the wheel. So it's no messing around with God. And he will... Uh, in my own life, he put pain into my life until I got to the point where I said, okay, I'm ready to give it up, and I'm ready to be totally 100% yours. And that only happened to me uh, 18 months ago. I've been a Christian 38 years. So it took me a long time, but I'm on. I am on. I we am can stuck. see that. We can <laughs> see that. Um, and it's the best. It's what? the best years of my life, you know. But anyway, so... That's what, you know, I mean, it took some pain in my life to get there, but I'm there now. What Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> what happens with the clay when you so throw it down? So we have to really get on. So God has to sometimes use, you know, something pretty major in our life to wake us up. And when you hear me putting the clay on, you will hear what, you know, sometimes has to happen. And that's, you know, it's like, that's his way of saying, you are in, you are mine. This and that's what, he, you know, you are mine. You are, I belong to you, God. Do, does it strengthen the clay to throw it well, down? It does just, it align the molecules? Yes. It, it actually takes some of the air bubbles and some of the imperfections and gets them so that they are more together. So if you didn't throw it down, then you wouldn't be able to... Well, sometimes it just falls right off. Uh -huh. If I didn't so throw it down hard enough, I have to start over again. So I actually have to take the whole chunk off and actually reform it again, which is another analogy in our lives. I mean, I'm sure that we've had that happen in our lives where, you know, here I am again. I feel like I'm off the wheel. I'm getting remolded again. Yes. But this time, hopefully the second time you're on. Uh-huh. So, oh, so, you, so, so then you can go ahead and start working on the clay, but not until it's completely 100% on. So is it on now? It's on. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. So then we can start using the hands of God, and God can start forming in us into what. And at the beginning, it's going to be very coarse and not uh, a pretty sight. You know, it's just going to be <coughs> tell us about full of imperfection still. Tell us about centering. How you have to put the so pressure on got really to hard at first. You, God's got to use I mean, huge amounts of force and pressure in order to get this, the 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 clay molecules centered so they're completely in the middle of the wheel where it can work properly. And if the, we aren't like that in our life, if we aren't allowing his hand and by listening to the Holy Spirit and obeying, praying and obeying what we hear him to say to us in little baby steps, then that's how we get there. And so that's what that, that pressure of the hands is. So, so but now I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, it's my. This is a little bit my way. So okay, can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay. I can. I have a log voice. So. Um, so at the beginning, is it more intense than later? I. Uh, you press down at the beginning. There's a lot of pressure, harder. and um, my hands are really working hard right now. And the bigger the hands, the easier it is. But I'm applying huge amounts of pressure, and a big chunk of clay. This is very interesting. Just flew off. And that's kind of like our lives. You know, uh, when he asks for something, sometimes we got to give up something, something of ourselves. And it just flew right off. That's the first time that's happened all day. So this, this piece <laughs> of fun. clay needed to be trimmed in order to be 
formed. As you uh, mold the clay, does it get less intense in terms of the pressure that you have to apply to it? Well, I have to watch the clay and make sure that it's not wobbly. If it's wobbly at all, then I have to bring it back up. The, you know, the forming has to happen again if I'm not centered. So, so that centering is really important. So, so what really I saw that, down. what I see that in my own walk is, you know, making that commitment to an absolute daily time of prayer and Bible reading every single day without exception. Mm -hmm. That that time is God's time. And I had to actually, you know, make a time where I had to get up earlier in the morning in order for that to happen. It was the only time that I had it. Do you use every part of the clay? Do you use it all? Is anything wasted? Well, like this part that flew off, uh, it won't be actually used in this piece, but it will be used in something else. So the way I look at it that spiritually is if I had a pain in my life, something that, was, uh, that had to come off of me, then this would be a way that I could minister to a brother or sister. So I'm adding that to my brethren or to my sister in Christ when I minister to her from my heart of need. So where we reach people is from our hurts and from our struggles. That's where we're authentic. And that's where we're, you know, reaching the world, the lost world, is with our pain. Mm -hmm. It's not with our victory. We're reaching them with our pain and what God's done for us. That's exactly what we talked about this morning, about your wounds being your credentials. Uh, because it's from your pl you, the woundedness that you can reach out and... Uh, empathize and understand. So that's why we've been talking all weekend about listening to your life, listening to the pain, don't shove it away, listen to it, and hear God's call in the pain of it. See how she's bearing down there and centering that? It's way more pressure at the beginning than later on. Um, and, um, okay, so um, now, Mary, what if you glazed it before you formed it? What would happen? If you put glaze well, if, if, that, if, I, if I had a hardened surface on the outside, then anything else that I would do to it wouldn't penetrate. So we have to be soft and we have to be open to the Lord. If we apply you know, some cosmetic you know, shell on our life where God can't penetrate that, then we're just going to have to get cracked again. We're going to have to get, there's going to be some more pain in order to get through that. Right, and that's what so I... So the softer we can be, the, the better more off. open we can be, the more flexible, the more God can use us more immediately. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, now I'm applying a lot of pressure at the front of the clay because I'm trying to bring it up higher. Are you um, sensitive to how much the clay can take in terms of pressure and does it sometimes have to rest in between? Well, I have to vary the speed on the wheel in order to uh, get the effect that I want. So when I'm hollowing out the inside to make the cavity here, I'm using a lot slower speed and I also have to pressure or apply pressure on the outside. And so uh, when God is doing more fine tuning on our life, we might appear it might appear to others that it's kind of slowing down but really in actuality what he's doing is uh, opening us up to a point where we can hear him better I guess yeah well you had said something else that was really good that later on as the pot gets higher and as we grow in faith we are more attuned to God so the pressure sort of decreases yeah. and because we're listening a little bit better and because we're more uh, connected to the potter the pressure isn't as strong and it's as you said more fine tuning than anything right. else. What do, what do you do about imperfections in the pot? Well like right now I'm, I'm struggling because I feel some lumps in the clay mm -hmm. and the lumps are areas where it's like well, maybe there's some unforgiveness or some bitterness. Maybe we've got some uh, resentment towards a family member. I know for me, that's what I, I had to do a lot of healing inside uh, with my relationship with my dad and my mom and my brothers and, and uh, 
my ex-husband actually um, 25 years after my ex-husband left me I had to call him up and ask forgiveness it was the hardest thing I ever did and that's when the breakthrough happened in my life so you know if God is is urging you to deal with something pay attention to that little voice because sometimes it's not so little but that was the point of obedience that I had to do and after I did that he was shocked he couldn't believe after 25 years that I would call him up but it was a it was an open door it was a something that I had to do in my soul in order to get free and uh, and uh, anyway so pay attention to those little bumps because God doesn't he doesn't uh, ignore them and if you hear the voice of the Lord urging you um, just from experience <laughs> you know obey and, and listen and don't argue about it just go through it and so are the bumps work into the, the uh, yeah. mold then sometimes it takes actually a poke I have to take this hard uh, stick in order to get the air bubble to go or the imperfection uh -huh. to get out. Right, right. And it, I mean, you can imagine that it wasn't easy for me to call my ex-husband and ask him forgiveness. It was the hardest thing I ever did. But uh, there was some reason that I needed to do that. Maybe it was something that he needed to hear. I, it's not for me to ask. It's just for me to do. And um, so that's just an example of uh, an imperfection that God might ask us to be healed of. And uh, like we talked about the hamster wheel having a horizontal focus, you know, it's, it's a little stretch, but if you're the clay, you're looking up into the eyes of the potter. So it's a completely different focus. It's a vertical focus rather than horizontal. Um, the other thing is, uh, you can see that Mary is powering the wheel. The clay is not making the wheel move on its own, right? Mm -hmm. So she is completely in charge. And again, as we sang and we've been talking about, uh, the clay is yielded to her. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask her while she's doing this? While Mary's doing this? Any, any thoughts about the clay? Or, yeah? I noticed you've got a sponge or something. We've got a sponge or something is the question. What's the sponge for? The sponge just uh, basically protects my hands. If I were to, I could do this all just with my bare hands, but the sponge uh, gives me a buffer between the clay and my um, flesh so that I don't chew up my hands so much. But it's, uh, I actually have more control if I just use my fingers. So when I do the finer tuning, I take the sponge away. So that's another one. That was a good question. Any other questions that you want to ask her? As you can see, the pot is not on the wheel by itself, right? God's hand is actively involved in the mix, which goes against the hamster wheel where, except for the video that was shown where there were two hamsters running in the wheel, which I've never seen before in my life, but the solitary circu uh, circular motion that the hamster is is in is different because God's hand is always in there and a lot of times we can tell that God's hand is in the mix because we have hope we know that we're being formed we know that there's a larger purpose and I don't know if you saw that lump of clay before I mean it was a pretty icky lump. there's some clay over there too that can't be used right Mary right now you showed it to me it was really icky it's um and this this kind of represents for us God's timing. There's, uh, we talked about having to wait sometimes. This clay over here can't be formed into anything. I mean, it went, it went through the mill this morning. It was all the junk that flew off. So the part of our life that, uh, you know, this goes through the muck. Sometimes it has to rest for a while in order for it to be added back into a fresh lump of clay. So, um, I don't know, the symbolism for me is that God uses every single bit of our life, even the junk, even the struggles, all of the pain, all of the heartache, all of the, you know, the unforgiveness that we had. God uses it all.
by ministering to our brothers and sisters. Because when we get healed, then, then, then we have something to give. So, be able to use that so that will be best. used. She'll be able to use. What she's saying is nothing gets wasted. Right now that can't be used over there on the table, so it has to rest a while. Or the other um, connection with us is that it can't be used unless it's mixed with clay that's the right consistency. Mm. And we thought of that in terms of so much our need for community, for one another, that sometimes we've just been through the mill uh, and it's been too hard and we can't reform. But when you mix new clay in with it, when there's more that's the right consistency, it can be formed into a new uh, pot, a new vessel. And the, the other thing that I've learned in my walk about that is that um, when I'm pulled aside like that and maybe I don't see anything happening in my life per se, that's when I need to be focusing on praising God and just thanking Him for even though it isn't great and even though I don't see my family members, I have so many family members that I pray for and I don't see them coming to Christ, but God knows and he's working in those people. But it's not my job to question, but it's my job to thank him and to praise him in spite of what I see. And that's what I've really learned. When I'm, when I'm feeling like I'm in the muck tank, that's when I need to praise him more. And tell us about, now you shared with uh, me one time about how when you're doing the pot, uh, stuff can fly up into your eyes and that there's a lot of things on there that uh, just kind of fly off. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, the pressure in our life might be so intense that actually some of the clay actually is flown into my eyes when I'm throwing the pot, and it caused my, t my eyes to tear up. And the, the way that I saw the Lord speaking to me about that was that that's exactly how he feels. He is so close to us. He's so in love with us, that he feels every one of our heartaches and every one of our pains, and it actually touches his heart to the point of, you know, God's tears. God weeps for with us. us. Yeah. Yeah. As he as he molds. But us. he knows where our ultimate end is, and so it's worth it to him, yeah. because he knows that he will have his way. Any other comments or questions for Mary as she uh, does the pot? Yeah. Where does the clay come from? <laughs> Where does clay? clay come from? I, uh, I, I, um, hmm, good question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all just basically silt, isn't it? It's silt that's made kind of uh, more hardened by the sun. Or? Is there a certain kind of clay that you use, a certain kind that's the right consistency for molding a pot? I use, I use stoneware that has a little bit of grit in it. It has a little bit of sand in it because... I find it easier to use, and so I um, I like something that has a little body to it, not too soft. Because that's what that was over there, clay that was too soft. It couldn't be molded, so you need a little something in there uh, that has some texture so that you can kind of get your hands around it. That reminds me of Israel, the word Israel. Does anybody know what the word Israel means? The, those who wrestle with God. Yeah, and so there's a, a process of sometimes we wrestle with God before we surrender, but there's a little bit of grit in there. Um, interesting, God could have chosen any kind of people he wanted, and he chose those who wrestled with him. Uh, maybe he thought there was more authenticity in that than people who just rolled over. So that's good. Anything else? Any, any other thoughts or comments? Did play start as slip, and did you have to work it, get it to a certain consistency? I know you were kind of moving it back and forth a little bit. But did it start really super mushy before you put it on the wheel? No, I had to... Uh, the question it. was, did it start super mushy before she put it on the wheel? I had to take the hard clay and kind of soften it a little bit before I could start working with it. So I had to uh, knead it, actually, with my hands for about five minutes before I could even start. So did you pound it? Yeah. You had to pound it. And so that, was that necessary before you could mold it into anything? It went through a bit of a trial thing. And I, if I were the clay, I pr probably wouldn't have liked that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Anything you want to you know anything about pottery? It's right here. <laughs> you can ask. 
Yeah. What, I'm sorry, what was it? How do you know that? It's finished? Yes, it's finished and you need the shape. The question is how do you know when it's finished and you will give it the final shape? I guess uh, the way I'd ac answer that is uh, the clay can only take so much molding before it finally is at the point where it just needs to stop. And the potter can tell by the clay when it's just, it's had enough. And it's... Uh, you can tell when it's had enough? Yeah. The, it, How do you it starts tell when to it's... Get, it gets so soft that it won't, it, there's so much moisture in it. It's been uh, molded so much that, like, this piece of clay is about done. If I try to bring it too much more in, it's probably going to lose its shape on me. So... Uh, I can stretch it a little bit more in with my hands, but not too much more. And, um, and you, so that's the touch of the potter on uh, us, where he knows where we just, uh, but it's that fine tuning. And um, maybe we just need a time to set aside for a while before he can come back and work on us again. So, so again, God's timing. And again, you knowing by the touch, how, how you touch the clay, whether it's wh what you can do and what you can't do with it. And you're very sensitive with that, obviously. So that's you know why, obviously, doing. we just, we are in his hands. We need to completely, and, and just, uh, in spite of what it looks like in my life, like right now, I probably have 20 family members I'm still praying for. But I have never prayed so hard as I did in the last 18 months. So I know my prayers are going to be answered because I am not praying for no reason, you know. And so um, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, we have to completely trust him implicitly in spite of what our circumstances are. That's what I, I just keep reiterating, that even in spite of what we see in our lives, it is our job to thank him for every blessing that we have, regardless of what it looks like. You know, I mean, I even thank him for my my son who's had to go to jail, you know, who's in, in a trial right now. I'm thanking God for that. You know, it's not easy, but I am, because I know that ultimately his, his will will be done. But it's not easy to do that. So um, is that so, almost done then, yeah. that part there? Okay. And it was so cool because, you know, the Lord is a trip. Uh, my son had to go to, tra to jail, or he had to go to a trial, and he was going up in front. And the minute he walked out of the courthouse, the Lord said to me, call Caleb. And I ran to my fold, and I text messaged him. I said, how are you? And he had just walked out of the courthouse. And he said, how did you know that? Because I had no idea when he was going in or when he was coming out or anything. I said, Holy Spirit, Kayla. Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he just, you know, it's like, that was the Lord. Those yeah. are winks that yeah. he gives us. Little winks. So, you know, it was a witness to him. He said, nobody else called me. How did you know? <laughs> well, that goes with what you're saying so, about being in touch with God. You can begin to hear his voice and know uh, what he's saying and the pressure is not as intense then because you're tweaking it uh, but you're not you don't need to center it because you're centered and you're listening and you're available to him and that was my way of saying thank you Lord my prayers are being answered I don't understand this but I'm just going to thank you for it so good thank you so much can you're we welcome. give Mary a hand for that So you're trimming off the. You gonna take that off now? I have to let this rest for a while. Let's see, okay. So there's always timing, always God's timing. Look at that. Isn't that great? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Very cool. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, we we can go back to the PowerPoint for a minute. I just want to sum up all that. That was uh, good stuff, and um, that's what we just did. Okay, so that was the transition.
And then we read those scriptures about God being the potter and, and we're the clay. So that's what. So God uses everything. Nothing is wasted. I think that came through really clearly. Um, if it's not used for the pot that she's making, it use, it's used for something else. And that God's timing is perfect. We heard how the clay sometimes has to rest. Uh, she knows exactly when to stop molding it, when it's had too much. I get impatient with God sometimes, and I want him to just hurry up. But the truth is God knows exactly what he's doing in my life. And so, um, the clay, uh, you know, th that calls for us to trust. And then um, we heard that you couldn't glaze it, obviously, before you mold it. Otherwise, the clay solidifies. Um, what we need is transparency <laughs> before God. We talked this morning about the spiritual language that can keep us from being real. And I suggested that you uh, write a letter to God and let him know exactly what you're feeling. Or simply read a psalm that seems very honest. Or... Um, you know, pray your own prayer of honesty. God knows what's in your heart, and there's nothing wrong with being honest before him. So the transparency, the flexibility, uh, the moldability. And then portions of clay that aren't moldable, uh, you add more clay. So when we're weak, uh, we're flaccid, uh, we can't be uh, shaped into a pot or anything of use. Uh, sometimes we need community. We all need community. But uh, Mary's solution to that was to add more clay so that the consistency gets to a place where then it's a good consistency and that the clay then can be used. And we need to encourage each other in that way. At the beginning, you heard her say, centering the clay is intense. The potter is right on top of it, bearing down. Uh, once centered, the potter can lighten up a bit and begin to tweak the pot. It's not such a heavy pressure. So the pressure is less, it's more of a tweaking than an actual heavy intensity that you have to do at the beginning to keep the clay on the wheel and to be sure that it's um, not going to fall off. Um, and then we heard that the potter will often throw the clay down hard before beginning to work with it. It aligns the molecules and makes the clay strong enough to shape. But, you know, if you were the clay, you probably uh, wouldn't be too happy about that. Um, and change occurs, right? The lump was shapeless when it went on. Uh, it looked like it had no hope. Uh, and it, we get off a different shape uh, than when we got on. Very interesting that most things that you make on the potter's wheel, not all things, but most things, are fashioned so that you can hold something. And um, you know I love Henry now, and I already told you that. Uh, now it tells us that when we suffer um, and we're able to heal from that suffering, it creates more space inside of us to receive the love of God. That's essentially his principle. And I love that because when I see a pot or a vase or something that holds something, I'm aware that there's space inside. And the space is created by listening to your life, by not just shoving the pain under the rug or under the, in the closet, but taking the time to look at it, think about it, and say, God, where's the call in this pain? Or where's the call in joy? It creates space inside of you as you heal from that, and it's worked into God's plan for your life. Again, God can use anything. We're not saying that he can't use it if you're on the hamster's wheel, but it's better to be on the potter's wheel because the way is easier and you don't go through so many detours. Then I forgot. Oh, yeah, we talked about it not being a solitary venture. God's hand is involved in the mix. It isn't necessarily going to be easy, but we are never alone. What is the promise that is most common in Scripture? What is the promise that Jesus gives us more than any other promise in Scripture? Anybody know? Yes, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. Because Jesus knows that that's what we need to hear more than anything. And that sometimes it feels like we're alone. We are never alone. If you don't remember anything else from all of this, remember that. We are never alone. It, it, he says it over and over again. And it's one of the last things he leaves the disciples with. Because he knows that there's going to be days when they feel alone. And he keeps encouraging them. You're never alone. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Even when you're on that wheel. Um, again, God is making the wheel go round, not us. Different than that crazy hamster. 
Hamsters are stupid, but <laughs> our effort is to stay surrendered to him, staying flexible and malleable in his hand. Uh, and then we have the sense that we are being formed for a purpose, to hold more of God's love and be able to share it, be poured out and receive, be poured out and receive. That we are being shaped for service, that we are being held with loving intent. I believe we're shaped for service. I also believe we're shaped to receive and give God's love, and that's essentially the same thing. And then Potter's Wheel outcome, the outcome brings new life for us and those around us. It is not a futile venture. Do you see the difference between the potter's wheel and the hamster wheel? Again, our focus is vertical. We're not looking out at our shavings and our water bottle and our pellets and our salt block. Okay, It's relational, up and down, uh, not horizontal. We're looking up into the eyes of the potter as we allow him to work in our lives. It is not about me and keeping my world intact as is as is any longer. It's about learning a new way of being in the world because I'm being shaped in a new way for an abundant life of purpose and meaning, which is where we started. An abundant life is what Jesus came to give us. Doesn't mean a life without suffering, right? But it means that we uh, know our call and uh, we have a life of significance. We long for purpose and meaning created with that desire. Um, so, and then that is it with that. I want to just share one thing with you. Again, talking about wounds as being your credentials and recognizing that what Mary did here, um, she used uh, all the imperfections of the pot uh, and molded it into something beautiful that would be able to hold something good. Um, I, I, I had this conversation with someone today, um, and so I, I wanted to share it with you. Um, the person asked me about, uh, you know, what about imperfections, and how does God use them? And this is in the book, but it's something that when I realized uh, this insight, it has changed uh, my life in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, it just validated what I, what I kind of knew. But the question to you is, if you've read the book, you'll know the answer. Um, why do you think uh, Jesus was resurrected uh, with the wounds still in his hands? What was that about? Because, you know, if God was going to do it right, I mean, gosh, you know, why don't you take the wounds away? I mean, this is the resurrected Jesus. He appears to the disciples in the upper room, and he says, here are my wounds. This is resurrected Lord. He's been up seeing God come back down, revealed himself to the disciples. You know, why couldn't God do this right? Why were the wounds in his hands? What, just whatever, yeah. So that they would believe. There is a sense in which they needed to know that he was not a ghost, all right? And that's a theological uh, understanding of it, that he had actually been flesh and blood, that he really did die, because there was a movement on the time that said, no, he didn't really die, he just kind of was a spirit, okay? So there was that part of it. Anything else? Any other thoughts on that? Why the wounds? What's important about the wounds? Because we're talking about, a lot about suffering, a lot about woundedness being our credentials. Any other thoughts on that? Nothing? Nobody read seems, the book. Yeah. <laughs> like, I haven't read the book. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it just seems like um, even if you've had a wound and it's healed, it's not that the wound never occurred. There is still a scar. Yes. Still, yes. Just because it doesn't look like there's a scar doesn't mean there wasn't a wound. Just because it's... it's it, yeah, okay, it yeah. Even it when your wounds are healed, there, there is still a scar. What I believe Jesus was telling his disciples, I believe he's telling all of this, all of us now, is this. Um, we are meant to share our wounds with one another, as Jesus did with the disciples, in authenticity. And the way we share them is the way Jesus shared them, which was... I should have been dead. I should be dead, but I'm not. I'm not dead because of the grace of God in my life. And that's, those are our credentials. That's what points to God's glory. Because when I share my wounds, it's not about me, right? It's about how I failed. I haven't been able to measure up. But because of these wounds, um, the fact that I am standing here today, the fact that I am alive, the fact that I am able to um, talk 
to you and share with you is all because of God's grace, because of God's healing mercy. But if I don't share the wounds, you know, I don't know what God has done. And so our wounds are our credentials, and we're meant to share them in community with each other. Again, AA does this so well. Um, and the more authentic we can be as a Christian community, the more we will experience God's grace, and it will just catch on, and there will be a momentum. People long to know that there is hope. As we said at the beginning, they thought the crucifixion was the end. They thought the wounds were the last word, right? They thought the wounds meant death. Jesus comes back to the disciples. Not the last word. I should be dead, but I'm alive. I should have been destroyed, but I stand here today testifying to you that God is more victorious than any suffering uh, that this world makes you go through, that there is always hope with God. God always has the last word. And that's always a word of victory. As we saw in the pot, the shapeless pot, the shapeless clay with no form, God takes that and uses it and molds it. Even if he's got to throw it down a few times, we find that there is purpose for us and a hope. You are not random. You're not here by accident. Make sure that you use your life in a way that will allow you to recognize your call. What's the definition of call? Are you listening to me? <laughs> Our greatest joy meets the world's greatest need. You're good. Where, <laughs> where the world's greatest joy meets the world's greatest need. Where our greatest joy, I'm sorry, did I say that wrong? Where our greatest joy, where our greatest joy meets the word, world's greatest need. Okay? So remember that. I want to leave you with that. Now, are we ready to go to our small groups? I'd lo love for you to just process in small groups for about 15 minutes. There's three questions. You may actually have time uh, at this point to do all three. And then if you could, uh, we'll come back together. And if you have in one sentence, tell me what your group came up with as you uh, did those questions, OK? And we'll close that way. OK. <laughs> OK. You can stand up. Stand up and look, because otherwise nobody can, can see you. If you don't mind, you're used to standing up in front of people. So. <laughs> you can stand right there. One of the questions that we talked about quite extensively, um, give an example, if you can, of a potter's wheel experience that perhaps you have had. And if you are going through one now and the end result is not clear, share this as well. And um, we were sharing, and one of my thoughts was, you know how the junk that flies off, the, the woundedness, is part of the experience that we can share with others. And I shared with Rhonda that when she had her cancer diagnosis, um, it, it was an incredible wound. But a year later, when I had my cancer diagnosis, that wound was incredibly um, oh, great. <laughs> redemptive for me. And how I have seen her, how I have seen Rhonda share um, with so many people who have gone through similar things. That's uh, just an incredible um, gift that Rhonda has been able to give. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. You've got lots of time to think about it, people. I sent him around, not me, for a reason. <laughs> They're above average, so they don't share as much. <laughs> So we had the third uh, question about the char which characteristic of the potter's wheel did we feel um, related to us. And um, we said that um, we felt God use, we wanted him to use and mold us into um, his image or a way he could use us in our um, other people's lives and for the world. Um, and uh, we see him through change and different experiences. And through these, we have a revelation and see God in a new light. Right. We talked a little bit about uh, question two, the difference between potter's wheel and hamster wheel, and um, decided that the most key difference was who's in control. 
And, um, and then we talked a little bit about, well, sometimes um, it's hard to think of the potter's wheel as coming to an end, you know, that, that it's, um, it's at some point that it's done, that it's finished. Maybe, we're, maybe we all have um, different parts of our life that are on the wheel and, um, and they're being shaped at different speeds and at different rates. But still, we have to remember, it's still God in control, and we don't get to decide which ones he doesn't work on. <laughs> uh, we talked about uh, question number two and three. The f uh, number two is like the, the hamsters are actually providing that uh, momentum. The hamster is moving the wheel, as opposed to the Holy Spirit is in control to actually move the potter's wheel. So with the, to give the control to God and the Holy Spirit, that's number two. And number three is more on the lines of, we are very much in control most of the time. We want to know what the end result is. I want to make this part to be like this, uh -huh. if we were to make it. But God is making us as, as a potter, and we really don't know ultimately whether it's going to be a bowl or is it a, a vase or something else. So to be open to his hands and let him make whatever part that he wants to make us. That's excellent. So that's Thank you. <laughs> There's groups back there that are silent. <laughs> silent and dirty. Anybody else? <laughs> um, so for question two, we... Um, thought that about the the hamster wheel kind of doesn't produce anything or doesn't make anything it's not productive uh -huh. and the potter's wheel is kind of a foundation where you can be shaped up and um, you can be formed with and you know produce many different results um, and then for number three um, I guess Well, the, I guess for many of us, and myself included, um, kind of this, this journey and our purpose in life and what we're going through, and the end result isn't clear. Um, not really sure, you know, where God wants to lead us. And, um, you know, it, the way our country is right now and the recession and everything, it probably hits a lot of people, so... Okay, we, we talked about a lot of different things, but I think the part that uh, we shared was that, uh, first of all, in our lives, the molding is never finished, which differentiates us from, from the pot. Um, I kind of identify with the resting. I'd like a little more resting time. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that the process is very, very messy. It isn't, uh -huh, um, that's good. you know, it isn't something that just sit down and you keep your hands clean or anything. And, and right. I looked at that as a bit of, uh, we're in it together with uh -huh. our Lord. I mean, there's yes. there's points where there isn't clear separation. Yeah. I mean, he's in there, he's all over us, and we're all over him, and, and whatever it is, it is. But it is very messy. Yeah. And again, we don't know the results, but there's never really an end until we see him. That's great. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, our group focused on question three a lot. <laughs> And one of the characteristics we thought really rang true was kind of the initial flop that the, the clay goes through. Um, oftentimes when I put a new position, we're kind of like thrown into it. And we're like, what are we doing here? You may not want to be there. Um, but as, you know, the wheel starts spinning, whether it be quick or fast um, or slow and steady, that there's still growth. And you're kind of, not that you're stuck there, but God has you like right where he wants you in the middle. Um, and that initial kind of just, you know, snap and when you're thrown into it, there's, there's a lot to be done, but at the same time, you're right in the center of stuff, and that's where God wants you. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. So we talked about all four questions and um, pretty much what everyone else has been talking about, but then we kind of focused on the last little italicized part at the bottom. Good. And our one sentence for the kernel of truth was, don't be the hamster. 
<laughs> I like that. <laughs> Don't be the hamster. <laughs> she said that's a nugget of truth. That's <laughs> Okay, um, we didn't really discuss the questions, At any all. of them in specific, but um, no, we just kind of discussed as a whole, and um, Dale talked about how, you know, there's different types of clay in different parts of the world, and how you use different types of clay for different things, and how that can be related to spiritual gifts, or, you know, the body of Christ, and we all have our own little you know, we're all different, and we do different things, so we need to kind of come from different things, so. Yeah. so everybody's different, and yeah, God uses it And all. God Mold uses all. what we need to do, what we need to do, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, that's good. Anybody else? Is that it? Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I've so enjoyed being with you this weekend, and, uh, uh, you know, you're just an awesome group of people. You have a tremendous amount of talent, a tremendous amount of spiritual insight. God is at work in your midst. Uh, that's so obvious to me. So just know that uh, your future is as bright as God's promises for you, and that no matter what you're going through or what you're, whoever God's put in your life to care for, He will be faithful to you. Use it all. Uh, and uh, bring victory and hope out of any situation. That's the God that we worship. That's the God who we adore. And uh, he's right with you through it all. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful life when you know that you're holding on to him. And he's basically holding on to you, really. So let's pray together to close this time. Lord, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for the metaphor of the potter that you've used in Scripture to teach us about surrender and also to teach us about how your hand is in the mix uh, when we surrender to you. Lord, so give us that ability. Bless each person in this room. Lord, we can't surrender on our own. We need your Holy Spirit, Lord, to help us to do that, to help us to let go. Lord, may we trust you enough to give our lives to you one more time, because uh, we know this is an ongoing process throughout our lives, uh, to give ourselves to you on the potter's wheel and to allow you to form and fashion us into the thing that you want to create. And we know, Lord, that you look at us with a loving intent. And even when it's hard, Lord, your plan and purpose is more glorious than anything we can imagine. So, Lord, we submit to you now in this time. We know one day we will see you face to face, and all of this will be clear. But until then, Lord, we trust you, and we know that you have us graciously in the palm of your almighty hand, and we thank you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.